Okay, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think I'll start by introducing um, my guests who I'm delighted to have us joining us um, and then I'll introduce myself and then I want to uh, do a brief overview and then we'll get right into the discussion. Um, so today we're presenting software and scholarly communications, uh, which is a round table. Um, and we're gonna begin with James Housen, who's from joining us from the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where he is an associate professor in the School of Information. And he studies people at work building technologies, particularly free and open source software, and scientists building software. He has an active research projects on understanding transitions from grant funding to open source style peer production of software and science and on promoting software citation. Next, we have Veronica Ikashoji Orlati from Vanderbilt University and a Clear Fellow. She and I had the uh, uh, opportunity to be in the same cohort. So I'm really excited to have her here as well. Uh, she's the 2016-2018 CLEAR postdoctoral fellow in data curation at Vanderbilt and uh, is a co-organizer of 3D VR creation and curation in higher education, which was in a colloquium that was held at Oklahoma State um, at Oklahoma University and is going to be the co-editor of the forthcoming CLEAR report on that same topic. Um, her disciplinary home is in ancient Mediterranean archaeology, where she writes on ancient Greek ceramics, musical performance, and methodological issues surrounding transforming artifacts into data. Uh, and we also have Neil Chue Hung uh, from the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, he is um, the director of the Software Sustainability Institute and is based at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he's the editor in chief of the Journal of Open Research Software, an example of uh, software uh, of a software journal, and co-chair of the Software Citation Implement Implementation Working Group at Force Eleven. He's interested in how uh, new scholarly communications is changing um, to recognize software as a research output and what the effects of that will be on research culture. Um, so this is really exciting for me. Um, there are a lot of points of uh, shared disciplinary uh, overlap, but there's also uh, people working on various things that um, I'm, I'm just learning about. So uh, just a reminder to the group, we're eager to build um, our shared knowledge base and to learn more from the community. So as Sarah um, and Jessica have said, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to drop them to the chat or raise your hand. Um, so from who I am, uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University. I work on a project currently on uh, cameras in cars uh, in the Sinosphere, so in, in the greater Chinese um, cultural and syntic language sphere. Uh, so I'm really interested, for instance, in how formats of uh, video uh, transmit themselves across various devices. Um, so um, I'm going to begin with an overview of digital scholarly communication from my own disciplinary backgrounds and interests, um, and just speak briefly um, about those the way in which that situates me as a researcher. Um, I come from a, a digital humanities background, um, so we see a lot of executables and software and com scholarly communications. Um, so something like source code is, is a space in which I'm learning my way into. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm, today's topic is informed by my own research related to digital video capture, storage, and display. Um, prior to this, I was the postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, um, where I was a clear fellow working to build that network. Um, and so from these uh, disciplinary frameworks, um, broadly based in the humanities, um, I have an eye towards how software use, production, and citation are and can be part of scholarly communications as a, as a larger ecology. So we designed this episode uh, to be a broad overview of software and scholarly communications. And I should note here that um, I went back and forth with where to put digital in the title and how to kind of conceptualize that, which I think is an interesting moment to think about the way in which scholarly communications, the digital and software are kind of all working in tandem. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, and I'm also coming from a Canadian um, institutional setting right now, so um, I'm gonna ask various guests uh, for their input, um, but I'll start today um, with some of the um, uh, issues that I, saw raised in a recent scholarly communications roadmap publication. Um, this comes out of CARL, um, which is the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Um, and this outlines um, five key areas, um, and you'll see on screen right now I've highlighted number two, uh, which is to promote and accelerate the adoption of open science policies. Um, so this roadmap uh, defines uh, open science as being um, 
uh, used in the broadest sense and encompassing um, all domains of research, including the social sciences and humanities. Open science is commonly used in Europe and has been defined as, quote, the practice of research in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute, where research data, lab notes, and other research processes are freely available under terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of research in its underlying data and methods. Um, which I think is a, a really interesting way to, to start this discussion around uh, scholarly communications and software in general, uh, building from this idea of open science. Um, so, so building from here, we can see there's a clear shared interest in what Carl is uh, articulating for changing uh, scholarly communications practices and what the, the SPIN network and the DPC are focused on in relationship uh, to software broadly. Um, and here, I, I do want to keep this definition of software broad, um, so from source code, executables, uh, emulation and preservation, all of these kind of interrelated spheres. Uh, and also software as, as a method, which is some of uh, what we heard last week in the, in the webinar. Um, so I'll be interested again to, to talk to the guests about um, how this idea of open science and how we might think about this as a frame uh, for today's discussion. So before I turn the mic over to the guests, I also just want to highlight the, the fifth uh, element of the CARL roadmap, which is to expand the types of research outputs that contribute to formal scholarly communication systems. Um, and, uh, and to think about here that uh, Carl defines this as uh, research outputs that are rapidly evolving and increasingly reflect new or blended forms of scholarship that support research and education. So, um, and I have to, uh, to thank a colleague for highlighting the fact that here that the word actually, uh, the word software doesn't appear, um, which I think is um, a really important um, uh, point, to, point uh, to, to bring to the fore that, that not mentioning software is also kind of a, it might be seen as a, as a feature here um, and a way to, to grow our conversation that the ecology of scholarly communication is vast um, and deep. And so how do we keep um, both of the, the kind of um, the source code level in, in focus as well as the, the kind of broader idea of scholarly communication? Um, so it's a chance to discuss ramifications of software within this framework of scholarly communications um, and how we can sort of situate this term software uh, in their conceptions, um, I think in my guests' conceptions of scholarly communications. Uh, so in, in my final uh, bit of introduction, I just want to bring up um, an, op uh, an opportunity of projects that I'm most familiar with coming from my work at uh, University of Toronto. Um, and, and my postdoctoral fellowship um, around kind of objects that I, I would say fall into these ideas of Carl's uh, blended research outputs. Um, so these are the projects that I'm the most, uh, as I said, I'm the most familiar with. Um, so if we think about here, the Mellon funded collaborative projects such as Mirador, um, and this comes out of, uh, Mirador is coming out of Harvard, a conglomeration between, or a collaboration between Stanford and Harvard, uh, as well as many um, different, that, those were the initial um, user, uh, developers, uh, something like VizCall, which you see on screen here, which is a, um, a, a group coming from U of T, from the Center of Medieval Studies, um, the Schoenberg um, uh, Library of uh, Manuscripts, and a Mellon, uh, as well as the broader project of digital Digital tools for manuscript study. Um, so I've just offered a, a description here from um, some of the, the collaborators and researchers from Digital Tools for Manuscript Study about why they chose to go with um, building out of uh, building systems using Omeka and VizCall in order to create these open source um, interoperable uh, uh, tools that are that are these kind of blended researchers. So VizCall, for instance, addressed a need to bring manuscripts that were distributed globally uh, into a shared digital workspace where they could be collated and commented on and annotated um, jointly. Um, and digital tools for manuscript studies. Um, there's a there's a link here on the website as well. Um, is is doing the same thing where that we're looking at the way in which paleography can be done through annotations uh, jointly uh, in a digital workspace. Of course, this is one of many, these are, um, it was difficult for me to choose just these two examples, but there, um, there are many different examples of this kind of blended um, 
scholarly output that is, uh, I think, the way in which scholarly communications and software can sit really beautifully together. Um, and I see this as how the humanities, for instance, are making use of this kind of reporting where we're making um, data open source. Um, here in Canada, we have the um, SHRC, which is the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, which is changing also its uh, data uh, reporting um, uh, mandates. Uh, so there'll be specific practices um, that are that are going to be uh, part of this uh, also granting agency um, reporting that I think will be important as we see more and more of this kind of blended research. Um, so I also want to just emphasize that um, thinking across the disciplines for best practices um, and thinking about how citation is such an important part of the way in which we acknowledge our debts, um, to, to quote Sarah Ahmed's uh, important work from Living a Feminist Life, and the way in which we can find um, shared similarities across the disciplines, um, shared ways of failing forward and uh, iter being iterative in the way in which we think about the, the way in which software and scholarly communications are growing. So uh, on that note, um, I'd like to just transition to um, our, to open up the discussion to our guests who have, uh, I'm sure, lots of uh, important uh, responses to things I've brought up or uh, questions that I have uh, offered here. Um, so James, if I could perhaps start um, with you as I introduce you first. Um, could we um, I mean, and I think um, I'll just clarify quickly what I meant by uh, where and when um, the discussions can enter the research process. I'm really, um, like I said, I'm coming from um, an institutional, um, uh, you know, post-secondary institution, uh, but we can speak broadly across, um, you know, research processes inside the um, academia and outside. So, uh, James, if I could uh, start with you. Hi, I'm James Howison. Uh, I think I've got the video on and the audio on. Can someone just confirm yep. that? All right, uh, fantastic. At least for me. <laughs> All right. Well, so it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me along. Um, so, Elizabeth, you you want me to dive into uh, talking about these questions specifically, or did you want me to talk about some of uh, to do an intro? Or I'm, I'm happy either way. Uh, I, I mean, maybe we could start with the discussion questions, unless there was something that uh, yeah. just came up. That would be great. Um, I'm really interested in the like where these um, the kind of questions around software preservation can enter this discussion of um, sort of research and scholarly communications, because sometimes you get to the end of a project and it's sort of like rebuilding the the fragments on post-it notes, and um, so trying to think about workflows in a in a sure. dynamic way. That would sure. be great. Sure. So uh, I think that people will remember uh, the uh, possible non-controversy that has become known as Climate Gate, uh, which was uh, an institution in the UK, and I can't remember the exact details, but there's a, uh, there's a log there of, uh, of notes from somebody trying to reconstruct uh, the code that was behind uh, some of the analyses about climate. And it's a wonderful document, sort of, uh, you know, it was a private journal of somebody uh, trying to trying to stitch together and pull together these things. So if you ever want a good motivator for uh, for things like that, and it looks like Neil's contributing the uh, uh, oh, it was the University of East Anglia. That's right. Um, so that's wonderful, and you can see you know the difficulty that that there is putting things together later. So I mean I think clearly the answer to that is uh, as soon as possible. Uh, there, of course, the big challenge is software is such a malleable artifact that. Uh, that people just want to get started. Um, so I think I think the the real opportunities are around points where the rest of the community uh, weighs in, right? So these are in grant proposals, um, in in publications, uh, potentially around institutional processes like uh, in IRB, um, and. Uh, I think I think the moment that uh, that comes up for many people is when my grad student or postdoc moves on. Uh, so those are some of the the points that I've I've seen these uh, software preservation discussions enter in. Great, Great. Um, Veronica, do you have a, a sense of uh, in your perhaps in your own research and how you I know you've been teaching um, as part of your postdoc, so maybe in the classroom. Yeah. Um, so. I think that 
so I come from a very humanities oriented background um, I'm an archaeologist by training and to my mind uh, often software is just not even thought of it's, an, it's always an afterthought it's like oh well I use this code to do xyz okay well how did you get there <laughs> how did you uh, and um, so I think those conversations can start a lot earlier sorry it was a backlit. But those conversations can start a lot earlier, but I agree that in terms of making actionable items and places where we can actually make a difference and start, um, you know, creating a workflow wherein software is an integral, considered an integral part of the research process, I, I agree that it's like really at the points where you get money um, or you get approval to do your research, right? It's, it's IRBs, it's grants, it's, um, it's places where the workflow tends to break down and that's either for financial reasons or practical reasons. So I do agree with, agree with James on that. On that. Um, but the conversations, you know, trying to edge them in wherever is possible um, is, has sort of been my approach because often the idea that you're even, you're like, oh, well, I used this R script to do this and I got some results. You know, okay, well, hello how yeah. <laughs> uh, making and having and really pushing on the importance of clear methodology in the humanities mm -hmm. and how software is part of that methodology, I think is one of the places where um, in a yeah. non outside of the workflow, we can make an impact. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and Neil, can I bring you in uh, on that as well? Hi, um, uh, delighted to be joining everyone for this conversation. Um, I think it's really interesting as uh, some of the things that we've noticed uh, doing work to understand where software is coming up in different research workflows show that basically software is being used almost everywhere across the process. And I think when we talk about how software preservation discussions enter into the research process, I think we see this kind of split between uh, those which are, are coming because of different mandates, perhaps. Uh, so we've seen things come up where journals are starting mm -hmm. to say that you should deposit your code, where funders are saying you should ensure that software is mentioned in things like data management plans or pathways to impact versus uh, the researchers who are simply trying to get their research done. And I think for me, the really interesting part of the research process is around how we can have these discussions about, um, I think it's, it's really around those principles of open science about enabling reuse and reducing effort uh, mm -hmm. and really about trying to persuade research groups that actually um, doing some of this software preservation helps onboarding new team members, um, help uh, attract new collaborators and really be of a benefit to them rather than what what you see on the other side which is software preservation being put down as something that people have to do rather than hmm. something that's useful for them to do oh that's yeah, I think that's really interesting and uh, especially coming back to this idea of open science and the way in which that can help to scaffold you know what what we've all all, all three of you have been saying too about you know uh, instead of it being a, a, about a breakdown in the in the work cycle or the the life of the research, but sort of thinking through that, knowing that it you know is good to do always and and early and often. Um, so, <laughs> and I think those are all really great points. Um, and so, I guess uh, as a corollary to that, I was thinking um, this issue around training um, and uh, when and where that can happen um, within various institutions um, and and in that discussion. So perhaps um, you know if you're not working as a co-PI on a um, on a you know a project that's funded through um, say Shirk that has this mandate, when we can start to begin to uh, introduce these to our to students, to other researchers. Um, I was talking to, I also come from an art historical background and I was asking just informally, um, you know, other colleagues who have major, you know, 5,000, 6,000 research photos. I think maybe that's very few compared to what Veronica might have, but, um, you know, thinking about even at that level, um, where the training for how to manage that kind of data um, and which softwares to choose, you know, thinking about preservation, even as you begin to um, begin as an early career researcher. So that's really um, where that, where I'm situated in that second question. So again, I'd love to hear, um, 
thoughts on on the idea of then training and how that how training is actually actionable um, for these for what we were just talking about. Cool. Well, I'll uh, I'll jump in. So when I've been studying projects and looking at ones that have been successful in uh, developing in an open fashion and really kind of building on on uh, you know peer production. Right? And I use the word peer production to mean the way the work's done as opposed to the license that open source mm -hmm. has. Um, the thing that seems to matter is ending up with a student involved who has significant experience in the, in the non-scientific open source world. That's what seems to matter, right? And, and, you know, I'm talking about interviews, looking at, I think we've spoken or looked at the, artifacts of 30 to 40 uh, funded projects, probably 50 to 60, uh, you know, software artifacts. The ones that have been successful have gotten people with experience in the open source world. So I think, I think training is relevant. And I think that when we talk about preserving software, which I think is, is really distinct from developing it in an open way. Uh, and then that's a distinction that I think we probably need to make here. Um, uh, getting getting students involved early in uh, large or at least potentially large distributed collaborations so that when they come into science, they already have knowledge of another way of working. I, I think that's what makes the difference. Yeah, I think that's Can great. I, and go ahead. Sorry, I was going, I was going to chip in there and, and sort of say that that really... Um, uh, mirrors something that we've seen working as part of the carpentries organization. So um, software carpentry, data carpentry, library carpentry. Um, it's all basically uh, training aimed at different types of researchers on the fundamentals of, of what it means to have the right set of skills to be a modern researcher. Um, and I think uh, the key thing there is that there previously was this kind of confidence gap where you might have researchers who were unfamiliar perhaps with uh, the best practices of developing software. And the issue there was not that they weren't going to create good software, but that perhaps they would not have the knowledge and confidence to bring other people in to collaborate with them uh, where their skills were lacking. So I think, um, one thing that's been really interesting is that as more and more researchers are getting basic training around some of the most um, fundamental aspects of software curation and preservation, such as using version control repositories um, or how to deposit software into um, institutional repositories, they're also becoming more confident to go and ask uh, for other people's help and assistance to make their software more sustainable, such as, uh, as James said, bringing people with experience from the open source community, um, or in the UK and increasingly in other countries now, we're seeing recognition of, of professional um, software engineers, research software engineers being based in universities that people can turn to for help. But that key thing is, is showing those examples that say you benefit from doing this rather than being afraid to um, to participate in this and collaborate with other people. Um, I, so one of the things I think this is a really interesting question, Elizabeth, and I'm really glad that you posed it. Um, and you know, the Carpentries are a phenomenal organization in terms of like upskilling and developing that critical software and data literacy, as Neil was saying, to actually um, even think about these questions. But I will say from a humanities perspective, there's an even bigger gap, and that's the basic realization that software is part of your research, and it can be part of your research. So it's not even like, do you generate software? It's what software do you use? And what impact does that have on your research output? Right? So the more people work towards digital humanities projects and the uh, more humanists work towards bigger scales, you know, you're, we're getting beyond the play. The, there are decisions being made when they choose a particular platform, for example, or choose a particular method for, you know, of like they're like, I'm going to do some web scraping and you know, get all my data that way. That those decisions impact the research output, mm -hmm. and I think that in the humanities, there's still a gap in under, 
for the most part, um, in understanding how software is part, um, or software can so fundamentally change your research output because the scale of work is changing. And oftentimes, you know, if you have a humanities question, you might say, oh, there's a tool that I can get my data or get my information with. Um, without necessarily critical evaluation of how that tool functions and what it gives you and what it doesn't give you. So I think that in addition to like the, the problem of just, you know, skills, learning skills and learning the tools like GitHub and version control, I think that they're, um, like one of the things we've been trying to do at Vanderbilt is we have this thing called the Tiny Data Working Group and it's Data for Humanists. And there are actually conversations based around looking at digital humanities projects, looking how they've been looking at how they've been built, looking at the questions that were asked and, and asking what's there and what's missing and how was it generated and how could it be done differently and how do those software choices actually impact your product. So I think that there's also that part of the conversation that needs to be had in terms of, you know, yeah. Yeah. where that fits into your research. Yes. Thank you. So yeah, these issues around methods and ethics of uh, tool choice and kind of informed um, informed consent going into a DH project, for instance, and what what certain um, you know if you're going to run a regression in in R, what you know what the kind of biases that might kick up and, and sort of be aware of those things. So thank you so much, Veronica. That's, um, that's yeah, James. Yeah. So one of the things I've been thinking about in this area is how do software engineers, for example, develop the aesthetic of the right way of doing things, right? And it really is an aesthetic. It's a, it's a feeling. It's, it's a, uh, it, it, you know, they'll they'll talk about elegance and code, but they'll also talk about you know the right way to do development. And in my mind, it comes from lots and lots of cycles, right? So you write some code, you share it, you get some feedback. Someone else builds on it, then you try to add to it later. But later for a software engineer means two weeks, a month maybe six months. What we see in science that is, I think, uh, hinders the creation of this um, aesthetic is that projects are on much longer cycles, right? So my understanding is that, uh, you know, a reasonable median number would be a year. Um, you know, the, the range is probably, uh, it's probably skewed to longer projects. So in some of, in some of our work, we've talked to projects and we've said, hey, who's not contributing that should be, right? That you really think should be and why? And then we've gone and interviewed those people. And one of the things that happens is that the code that they're working on has, you know, forked off much earlier. And then it, take, it takes a lot of work to bring it back. Um, and it's interesting, you know, what, what Veronica is saying there about, uh, about trying to build that training in early so that people can see the benefit. And Neil mentioned that as well. Um, it's hard to see the benefit unless you do it lots of times. So, so I'd love to hear some thinking about how we can kind of bring forward that, uh, that, that feeling. And it's a little bit like investing for retirement, right? Uh, it's, a, it's all about trying to just say, all right, well, think of yourself in a couple of years, right? What are the things you can do now to help future you? Um, and uh, I'd love to see some thinking, you know, around, uh, you know, from behavioral economics or things to, to, to change that. Yeah. Neil, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think um, there's some really great points raised. And I, I think uh, one thing is uh, in, in terms of Veronica's uh, uh, explanation of what it's like in the humanities, I can say from experience that it's very similar in many other disciplines as well. So the humanities are not alone here. <laughs> um, but I, I think uh, one other thing that um, could be mentioned around training and how to how to facilitate this is that often we don't really have a lot of role models to turn to or um, basically just descriptions of how people have made these choices have decided uh, what to do and and importantly actually when it goes wrong as well um, and it's something that's really interesting in in the broader software development world, you quite often get people posting up blog posts, which are all about how they've tried something and it's gone horribly wrong, and they're never going to try this this way again. And more broadly, perhaps what we need is is more um, blog posts from people uh, doing the same thing for how software has affected their research practices as well. So, you know, I tried this tool, which was supposed to do this regression, 
but it's introducing this error that I just can't understand. Mm. Uh, and that idea of, of opening out this discussion around the role of software in the research process and making it okay to talk about it um, in a similar way that it should be okay to talk about why their, your data might not be as clean as you want it to be uh, is important in just ensuring that we don't go down this route of being very closed in the research that we do. Yeah, I think that's, those, those are all such important points and this idea of, um, you know, we're in the digital humanities, we have very long lived uh, projects and that sort of are at a, a, a pretty mature um, state. So I'm, I'm thinking here of like the Dictionary of Old English or um, Read, which is the records of early English drama, both are uh, hosted collaboratively, but um, also at the University of Toronto, and, and sort of thinking about how then these, these projects that are 20, 15, 20 years old, how some of the failures um, and successes, we might go back and, and sort of write those histories um, as a way of, of doing exactly what you were talking about, Neil, this kind of like, um, you know, best practices don't just spring fully formed that they're um, you know there are things that are learned over time and how we can think about those as a as part of the community so i think those are um those are really great points um, yeah i just if, if elizabeth let me just yeah, i want to jump in with a story about um people uh, you know some of the things that stop people sharing sharing software um and one of them is the people should do their own homework Right that way from you, uh, meaning I, you know, I've put this stuff together. This is part of my re my personal research infrastructure, and uh, you know, I did my homework, and other people should do theirs, and that that's something that is uh, is worth tackling. Um, I think that stories of uh, so so it's almost like you know this feeling that um, you know by sharing I will let people get involved without having paid their dues, and that is a uh, that's something that we need to tackle. And I'm not convinced that we can tackle that through shame and norming. I think we need to, as Neil says, like some, tell some stories of, of uh, that, that kind of validate those feelings and then set them aside. So for example, I was involved in a project called Flossmole and uh, you know, we scraped all these uh, software repositories and shared the data online. And one of the things that was really frustrating and disheartening was that uh, people did bad research with it right? They, it, it made the cost of entry so low that uh, anyone could slap together a bad regression. And um, uh, that was really upsetting to me. Now, there were, you know, opportunities to collaborate that came out of it that were really valuable. So I think, I think rather than just kind of, uh, you know, I think we need to validate the reasons that people don't share. And I see Neil is uh, posting up other reasons there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, rather than set them aside, because I think they really play a role in people's minds. Yeah, and perhaps um, I should just clarify, from my own perspective, it's like sharing uh, on a range of, you know, sharing what didn't work or sharing like, you know, we chose this file format and it changed and this is, you know, how we... So share. I think sharing could also take a variety of different, you know, sharing the, the successes and failures on on many different scales. So, you know, I forgot to preserve it in my, you know, institutional repository, that kind of, you know, so I, I agree that those discussions are, are certainly very valid um, and very important. And especially to come back to the idea of, um, you know, working within uh, academia, there's certain credentialing um, issues around single authors, um, you know, so there, I think there are multiple conversations that are happening and, and certainly do validate why people don't necessarily want to share, you know, tenure, pre-tenure, tenure, those are all uh, interrelated conversations and Veronica did you um I saw you nodding so I wanted to bring you in yeah no I was just uh this very much resonates with me because um you know I think somebody mentioned that there's a similar argument in the sciences for not sharing data uh and it, it's true it's the there's th these are cultural things that in some ways we're, that we're trying to change as much as you know practical workflow issues right it's the culture of uh reproducibility is shouldn't be a scary thing um reusability is, you know, even better. Um, and uh, I think a lot of those go in the academic world. I agree with you, Elizabeth. It, it often boils down to what do you get credit for? Mm -hmm. um, and, 
you know, you don't really get credit for a blog post, no matter how valuable it is, no matter how many thousands of people read it, and no matter how much impact that can have, you don't get credit for it in an academic environment usually. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, so I was just, it very much yeah. resonated uh, what James and Neil were saying. So. Great. Um, did you, Neil or James, did you guys wanted to follow up on any, I mean, I'm happy to stay here on this uh, topic or we can um, keep going with questions or did you guys have questions for each other? That's also, um, that might be an interesting. Well, I, I have one question, which is, uh, does anyone have examples of people getting credit for kind of informal discussion about their practices? I think perhaps the, um, Veronica, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the clear reports, I think, are a way in which that's starting to, to you know, like sharing within that community as a, as a peer, peer reviewed. Um. I was thinking about that. I was also thinking the International Digital Curation Conference and the practice papers, um, although generally they're successes that you, that you see represented. It's like, yeah. this project succeeded or this attempt succeeded, but, um, so in terms of like a professional presentation platform. But yeah. Yeah, clear reports. Yeah, yeah. Try to think, um, so, so we run a fellowship, which is mostly judged on basically people's engagement and interaction with community. Uh, and it rewards them with, with money to, to go to conferences and so on. And that sort of style of fellowship seems to be picking up. Um, in terms of other organizations doing similar things and and perhaps that's one way that uh, we can we can encourage people and reward them for doing this informal sharing is recognizing those who are making a valued contribution to the general discussion within the community uh, but the question is really can we make it about more than just indirect um, benefit by helping them uh, giving the money to help them to go to things that will give them direct academic credit. Uh, and I think we're still a long way off understanding how we could do that. Yeah. And I just want to bring um, just in the chat um, the, the idea of where scholarly um, work, uh, sorry, scholarly output and collective um, agreements meet and the advocation that um, is so important. So thank you, Sandra, for, um, for bringing that up. Um, and uh, Deanna also was bringing up um, astronomy. Uh, software papers that don't need research results. So um, I assume this is similar to getting uh, publications for your data sets um, in addition to sort of, um, uh, you know, then interpretation of those data sets as well. And I think that's really important. I also want to um, bring up um, the point of uh, these kind of research, uh, the, the funding models that are, you know, two, you know, two, three, five years, and the way in which this is also a, a kind of precarity, this breeds a precarity around um, employing research assistants, developers, um, and that those are all also issues, I think, um, from my perspective, that are important to address um, and when we're talking about getting credit and also thinking about, um, you know, having employment that is um, that is ongoing and build on knowledge rather than it being project by project because I know finding for instance developers um, that are working with say issues around um, Collation, you know, it's important that developers both both have the um, software um, and computer science background but also the knowledge for how a user who's been taught collation uh, from the humanities background. So that kind of, that, that's, those are really important skills that are not necessarily always put together. Um, so thinking about, you know, how we have, um, you know, computer science undergraduate students taking a digital humanities course and blending those two skill sets, I think is really important. And mm -hmm. giving students credit as, as, as knowledge co-creators, I think, um, from my perspective, yeah. is really important. I think that that chimes in with something that um, Alexander Roberts has just put into the chat, um, mentioning that is that dual-edged sword about we're being encouraged to share and engage um, but you may be less inclined to share when others might be benefiting from your work and perhaps that's the real change that that will affect not just software and scholarly communications but more generally how we build strong networks around scholarly communications full stop um, yeah. which yeah. is changing 
changing this idea that uh, we don't benefit from someone else using our work. Uh, and I think that's, that's quite a challenge. But I think if we want to build strong networks, they've got to be ones where we feel that we gain from other people doing great things with our work. Yeah. And Neil, could you maybe expand a little bit? Because I know that you're with Force 11, you're working on citation. And I think that's a key component of um, sharing. And, and as I said, um, you know, that citation is how we're acknowledging debts um, and how we give credit to, to people who are doing work with, with us or, uh, you know, using the, the work. So could you um, talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what you're doing with Force 11? Yeah. So, so obviously, um, citation uh, in publications is the is the kind of key way that we assign reputation to, to academics and researchers just now. Uh, and a particular problem has been that for things which are not seen as traditional research outputs, it's very hard to cite them and thus gain credit. So both um, for data and for software, there have been e efforts to try and basically make sure that the citation principles and also citation implementation for these kinds of research outputs work within the existing systems. So for software citation, primarily that is understanding how we ensure that publishers and editors um, have standard practices around the citation of software so that it can be counted uh, and also persuading researchers who are writing papers that they should be um, citing the software that they're using and finally also making sure that people who are developing software make it easier to cite and the challenges there are many challenges around that um, but I think uh, the key one and I think the thing that might we might see changing in the next few years is that uh, we're, I think, at the stage that in many research disciplines, people know that they need to do something slightly different in terms of software and the scholarly communications process. They're aware of the fact that perhaps it would be good to mention what software they've been using, how they used it, and what part that played in their methodology, perhaps. Uh, but there's no, there's no consistent guidance uh, mm. in different disciplines. So I think that will be the key thing is different areas, different disciplines, the digital humanities. Um, I know astronomy, as Dana pointed out, are doing a lot of good work in this area, working with researchers in those communities to develop um, software citation guidelines that work for them. Mm -hmm. And that's going, to, that's going to take a while because, for instance, we, we don't just... The, at present, for instance, we don't necessarily always know how to cite a blog post, for instance. Yes. Um, yeah. Or uh, if, we, if we have something um, like a, uh, a data set which has had many revisions or many authors, how do we cite that such that we're still giving credit to the people who, um, who produced it? So there are, there are many challenges, but the hope is that... Um, Soft, the software citation implementation efforts will help address these gradually. That's, yeah, no, those are really, those are excellent, super salient points. I mean, I'm thinking here even about um, in my own work, making sure that, um, you know, the URLs from sites from artists that are no longer, you know, how, how to make use of uh, the Wayback Machine and make that transparent mm. as, a, as a methodology in my own um, in my own research. Um, and uh, uh, James and Veronica, did you guys want to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in, but I, I didn't want to jump, jump in before Veronica. But um, yeah, so I think that the work that the Force 11 Software Implementation Group is, is doing is really important. And I, I hope to see, you know, different fields coming together and creating uh, kind of manifestos for uh, software and data and other uh, crediting you know, in their communities, right? So I think that people should be working to, to set up uh, birds for feathers or working groups or a task force within professional organizations to address this. So, so I think that's really key, you know, going forward to change the practices. I do want to kind of bring to people's attention one project that, that I'm working on with uh, uh, Heather Pivovar and Jason Priam at, uh, at Impact Story, which is kind of an old metric shop. And that's a, uh, a website called siteas.org. Uh, which is funded by the Sloan Foundation, and we're uh, really trying to tr to make a link between uh, 
the identifiers people use for software, so names of software, URLs of home pages uh, where they downloaded it from GitHub repos, and the author's preferred requested citation. Interesting, yeah. So if you go to sideeyes.org, uh, you know, and you type in like the YT project as an Astro project, uh, and somewhere on their homepage it says, hey, please cite using this, right? And it has some bib tech. And so uh, Sideeyes will go out and grab that. Um, so I really hope that that can play a role there um, in terms of bridging that gap. There's a funny thing is when you have a paper, you know how to cite it. Yeah. Right? it you just need the name of the journal. It's just the stuff in the top corner, right? The bottom corner. Uh, when you've got a bit of software, you have no idea how to cite it. Uh, so we're just trying to work to, to bridge that gap a little bit um, in addition to, uh, uh, to, to the efforts to change the practices of people in the, in the papers. So if we, if we can have a combo of knowing what to cite and how to cite it, then you know, we can drive uh, more reputation more reputable. We can give the tools for people to make their arguments for impact. Yeah. Veronica? Yeah, I've been, I'm sorry. I've been taking notes uh, furiously. So uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, so I think the, uh, one of the things that keeps that comes to my mind when we talk about cit citation of software is that fundamentally what we're talking about is citation of digital objects. So this is the same as citing a data set that you can't mm -hmm. just up and have in a journal. It's the same as citing anything that's like in a repository that isn't published in another format. And it's it's finding those, um, it's it's when you're actually generating the software or generating the data set or thinking about its use. So I think it's from both directions. It's like, how do you cite something that you are using? And then if you're creating it, mm -hmm. how do you generate something citable beyond like, mm -hmm. okay, so we version software, great. But um, how do you think about audience and, you know, are there, play, like, should we be getting more, um, like, uh, institutional repository managers involved in thinking about having, like, a software collection and encouraging their, their, their um, you know, employees at that institution to actually contribute to that so that they can, so that on the development side, you're also thinking about how do you make yourself citable. Yeah. Um, so... I think it's the, the training and education is on both ends to some extent. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the importance, I think, of, um, of libraries, um, you know, the scholar, digital scholarly um, communities or, um, you know, in the DH world, so like, you know, DH spaces and the way in which that um, those expertise and those knowledge um, can, can be so important for exactly what you all three were saying in terms of driving um, good citation practices and therefore also um, that, that drives reputation. Um, I, I have, uh, there'll be, after the recording is posted, there'll also be supplemental um, material, so we'll pull the chat as well. Um, and I know that um, uh, the, there's an easy, easy site, uh, Jessica, um, the link, um, which is coming out of um, the UC system, also for you know citing DOIs and digital objects and those, um, the importance of of being able to, to figure out how best to cite it um, so that it becomes again, uh, as as James said, looking in the corners, it's not so easy with a digital object. Um, uh, so exactly, um, we're we're about eight minutes away from the top of the hour. Um, I just want to um, ask Jessica and Sarah if there are uh, questions from the audience. Um, I'm watching the chat, but I, I just don't want to miss anybody. It looked like we had some great examples. Uh, so many really awesome references uh, in in relation to the topics that the guests, uh, all of the speakers sort of spoke to throughout the, throughout the discussion. I'm looking to see, I think um, maybe it would be useful to clarify, James, you put in there in terms of how side as is working in the ecosystem. It, it maybe do a little more detail to clarify how it covers both software and data sets. Maybe just so people know where that project is going and how comprehensive it is. Yeah, so uh, at the moment, uh, it works with data sets uh, somewhat incidentally in that given a DOI, it can return the metadata uh, that was deposited with the data set or with, with the object at the time the DOI was created. Uh, so that, that's something that's always been part of the DOI system, but for some reason not highly visible. In fact, I didn't even know that. Um, but I, the general idea is 
to go to where people have made their requests, right? So any producer of a digital object, you know, makes their requests for how they'd like to be credited. And so we go out and scrape anything we can find, right? So we'll, you know, for, for in the software world, we'll go into a, the R package repository and find the description file. In the GitHub, we'll look for a, a citation file at the top level. Uh, we'll also look for a DOI and a readme. So presumably there's a set of things we could do with additional plugins on the data side to, for example, find uh, landing pages for data um, and look at the requested citation there. Uh, I, hope, I hope that helps. So, so think of it as a web scraper that looks for requests and then links them to names and other identifiers. Yeah, that's great. That's clarifying. Thank you. Yeah. And I, um, if I could just say that, um, you know, also, you know, citing, citing developers as, uh, as part of the research team, um, you know, asking journals to make sure that that's, you know, when it goes to publication, that, that those are acknowledged um, co-participants, co I think, is a way also to go, you know, to move up the, from data, data sets to DOIs to, develop, you know, the people that were doing the development. It's also really important. Great. Um, Jessica or Sarah, are there other questions that I'm missing? Uh, maybe just if anyone, it might be useful here. We have maybe like a couple more minutes. If anyone has a, a major question here, what I see a lot in the chat, which is will be posted along with the recording uh, on both websites, DPC and the SPIN website, would be a, a lot of these are sort of comments and they're enriching the discussion. And so again, that, that discussion and all of these, uh, all of the links and references provided by different people will be made available on the website. But I'm wondering if anyone has any questions in terms of the attendees that they would like to throw out here at the end um, and maybe see who'd like to take a stab at, at answering any sort of <laughs> Any sort of final final questions? And then again, if we don't get to go into detail with the, the speaker for a question that comes up here at the end, it will be reported in the chat and we will follow up with all of our guests and see if they can respond um, post episode. Yeah, Veronica, could you just, um, uh, I know the clear report that you're working on the VR, um, do you have a, it, it will be early 2019, is that right? Uh, we're aiming for the end of 2018, early 2018. 2019. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that I think deals, yeah, that deals specifically with 3D, uh, 3D VR data. And, you know, I think that, at least for me, that sort of frames the discussion of, you know, software preservation and sensibility. It's, it's at, <laughs> at the end of the day, to my mind, they're all digital objects. And um, understanding how you can actually cite and incorporate into more traditional scholarly publication and research pipelines uh, things that are um, fluid, things that change, things that are in constant development and where their fixed formats are maybe, and, and their publication and the everything that goes into them is a little bit more opaque to traditional scholarly publishing, mm -hmm. bias traditional scholarly publishing standards. Uh, I think these questions overlap uh, in, in so many ways. So. Um, but that's sort of uh, yeah. Stay tuned for the report. It's uh, stay tuned. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I'll just follow up there. We did have a question here at the end, which we probably won't have time for our guests to respond to during the webinar. But again, we can s gather up the questions that people asked and and follow up with our speakers, and they can respond, and we can post their responses. So just yeah. thinking about this, suggestions for lobbying institutions to support. Yeah. Infrastructure, digital scholarly infrastructure, specifically in terms of research software. So yeah. something to think about. Yeah. I, I guess um, if if I could kind of like not answer it fully, but also introduce more things as well. Um, I, I think that's a really good question, uh, and it's one that I've seen driven in some of the discussions in the UK by almost a a case of pitting universities against each other and also get helping them to collaborate. So around uh, pointing out that uh, one particular university which has taken the plunge and invested ahead of the curve in a particular piece of infrastructure has had benefit, um, persuading other universities to, to um, 
basically implement the same sort of infrastructure and also encouraging them to work together so that instead of everyone doing um, slightly different versions that they're working to share their own problems. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to kind of just sort of say right near the end in terms of this is kind of going to your last discussion question around where, <laughs> where software is going in the next five years or ten years. I think there's two really interesting developments that are happening. Um, one is around the idea that more and more of our, our software, if it's being put into open repositories, is simply being harvested and archived anyway through projects like Software Heritage. So the question becomes not how do we preserve um, software, but how do we make preserved software useful to the research process? Uh, and the other one th that's really interesting is that um, increasingly people are using these kind of blended outputs like um, Jupyter Notebooks. And that, that's going to cause a really interesting disruption to the research process as more and more people publish these uh, and they become almost seen as the new papers. So. I think it's going to be a really interesting time for uh, scholarly communications in the next five and ten years. Great. Uh, unfortun unfortunately, we're right at the top of the hour, um, and I, I don't want to leave everybody without thanking our guests uh, very much for their time and their uh, prep work. Uh, it's been really delightful conversation, um, and I think really important. Um, and uh, so, please keep uh, typing. If you've got questions, type them in now, and we'll we'll try and get to them. Um, and I, I, again, I want to thank everybody for their time um, and, uh, uh, and for being here today. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Jessica and Sarah. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you to our research lead and facilitator, Elizabeth. Um, that was a great discussion. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Neil. And thank you, James. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. We really appreciate you being here and your participation on this episode. Again. This episode, the recording will be posted on both the SPIN and DPC website, along with a whole list of supplementary resources, some of which uh, Elizabeth prepared in advance, and we'll also include all of the links in today's chat. Uh, so I would just say that look forward to uh, this time next week, where we'll be featuring episode five, that's Scaling Software Preservation and Emulation, um, and that will be with research and content lead Paul Wheatley with special guests Maureen Pinnock of the British Library and Ewan Cochran of Yale University, as well as Klaus Reichert of the University of Freiburg and OpenSLX. So after the series is over, I'll just say this too, keep in mind we will be distributing a follow-up survey, so please keep track of all of the topics that you're hearing about that you want to know more about. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time.